This is a new deodorant called Australia. <laughs> and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, guys, if I can spray oh. a bit of Australia, that's the smell of an Australian uh, Australian whoa. armpit. That is right. oh. smells just like the junior that's high not locker a room. Smell. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, mm. blokes, Woo. now, hey, bloke. this is how you talk Australian. When you go in the country, they talk like this, and they say the skeeters got me last night. You may, say, what's the skeeters? That's the mosquitoes. Yeah. All right. And uh, I need you guys to kind of see, see if you can emulate my Australian accent. The skeeters got in me that. in the whop whop. <laughs> no, you stick to the <laughs> script, mate. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Beatitudes Worldwide coming back to you. It is so exciting to be back together with you for the Beatitudes, a show for Christian men who are seeking to grow in their faith or at least just have really great conversations about faith as they walk arm in arm in humor, holiness, and authentic fraternity. My name is Jeff Scheffelbein, and speaking of authentic fraternity, I have authentic with me, Paul Kolker. Howdy, howdy. And fraternity, Nick Besner. I'm the original. And together we make up the Beatitudes. Nick, where were you? I wasn't there. (laughs) (laughs) Lots of new things coming out. It would have been great if we all said something different in that (laughs) exact moment. Uh, Losing it. Yeah. (laughs) Brothers. Something positive. (laughs) (laughs) I yelled out the other day at work. I said, okay, everybody finish this on one, two, three, say something positive. And he goes, protons. And I was like, it's pretty good. (laughs) Nerd. (laughs) Nerd. (laughs) Nerd. Uh, so this is a show that only allows for in-person guests, which believe it or not, there's been some very big name guests ready to come on, but nope, we hold our ground. <laughs> We're yep. only in person. We actually have decided that you can't just be in person. You have to fly here to be on the show. <laughs> yeah. You have to leave Dallas. If you're from here, you have to leave and fly back. Yeah. Luckily, Southwest is pretty cheap, yeah. so you can pull that off still. Yeah. Um, but speaking of cheap flights, uh, but not cheap guests. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. We've got another Australian accent on yeah. here today. Philip Ryle. Welcome to the G'day. show, Philip. G'day, America. Yes. G'day. How you going, mate? <laughs> We're going like a frog's sock. <laughs> going off like a frog in a sock. No, That's I'm going to have to teach you. It's not the way to go. <laughs> We're having heaps of fun. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. I, I actually know one did. Thing. And I, loads. I listened to a loads. bunch of akadaka to get ready for you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm ready. I've had my Vegemite and I am ready to go. Ooh. Well, you know I can talk American too, and then I'll just fool, fool the audience all together. Wow, Is that okay? That's 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 pretty <laughs> that's close. A little that's bit awesome. like Borat. Too. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> not good. Not good. My <laughs> wife. <laughs> Uh, well, you joined us. I actually looked up some Australian words. So I'm going to try one. You, you joined us from Wop Wop. Wop Wop. Not Wop Wop Wop. Yeah. What come on, it? Jeff. We all knew what that. Is Everybody that? knows this. <laughs> from, what, explain whoop, that whoop. one to us. Wop Wop means like wherever. You know, the never never is another one. But Wop Wop means whoop whoop. You know, it means nothing. <laughs> That's a good we just make it up as we go. Yeah, we sure. Just, and, actually, and my business anyway. title. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff Shufflebein. <laughs> whoop whoop. <laughs> what does it just say you do here? <laughs> <laughs> whoop whoop. whoop. <laughs> exactly. We, no, don't ask, we don't ask questions. We just go along with whatever the lingo is, and we just become Australian. And we're just born into it, and we don't know what just, we're saying. You just go with it. <laughs> What's like the cheap version of an Australian airline? Oh. <laughs> Jets, Jetstar. Jetstar. Yeah. It's and sort of, you're like six foot, what, three, four? Yeah, that's right. And How does uh, Jetstar work out? Well, you know, you get your knees close to your body and uh, you ask for the exit row <laughs> and doesn't matter whether, whatever happens, I'm going to get out anyway. But no, it's uh, the cheap airlines are kind of uh, the way to go now in Australia because everything's so expensive. Mm. But yeah. Mm. Yeah. All over Europe, they're cheap, but uh, I'm not cheap. No, <laughs> you're not. Be. You're on the Beatitudes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That is like gold, basically. It's yeah, It's great to be here. All right. Thanks. Tell us how we got to be together. What's going on in your world? Who are you? Why, oh. What are you doing in the States, my friend? I'm exhausted by my life, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my wife tells me she's exhausted too. No, look, we're, uh, I, I've, uh, we're coming to America because we, uh, I've been running a business for 35 years. Uh, had an encounter when I was a young man. Love to tell you about that later, but... It, it caused me to be able to say, I just don't want to, uh, I just don't want a career, I want a ministry. I really want to be able to share what's going on in my heart in a way that could be amplified around the world. 
I just love Americans because there's such a positivity here. You're enthusiastic. There's a, there's a bit of a tall poppy syndrome that happens back in Australia. Oh, everybody get, knows you heard about that. About that old tall poppy syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> you see the Go big trucks. <laughs> no, I love Aussies. We're down to earth, but yeah. at the same time, we don't want to be too down to earth so that we're not tall. And you guys have kind of really shown showing the way in terms of amplifying and magnifying and just kind of giving us the kind of cheer on that we need. Mm. I'm here for that cheer on, but I'm also here to bring an, an Aussie flavour to something that I believe in pilgrimage travel is going to be um, quite revolutionary where unity becomes a beautiful part of pilgrimage. All right. Time out. We got to hear out. this. P- you're talking about pilgrimage all of a sudden. The company you're running is called Harvest Journey. That's it. What is this company? How did it get going? Well, really, it got going because, look, my father, when I was a young lad, he said, let's plan the hotel, motel holidays, tra- traveling around Australia. I want to get out the maps and you do the accommodation bookings and we're going to just let you do it, Phil. And little did he know that he was going to be uh, kind of chartering my future cool. in my career. And, uh, and, I, and I loved it and I, I just enjoyed the whole ge- geographics of maps and planning. And then later on in life, it's like God looks upon those things and, and he says, I can see a travel man developing, you know. And I love this concept of travel where people would, would go and overseas and come back changed and transformed. And so Harvest Pilgrimage, uh, I got the opportunity as a 22-year-old to uh, a, a gentleman from uh, a father from schools. Uh, he gave me a call and said, I've got this dream about setting up a travel company. Um, but he wasn't really interested in pilgrimages. But in my heart, it didn't take too long before I said, I need to create this into a ministry, a mission. And so Harvest Pilgrimages began. And it was like we were riding the wave of something that was really waiting to take off in Australia. As it was taking off, Pilgrimages was taking off all over the world in, in the early 80s. And, and here, here I was um, kind of making it up as I go. Yeah. And then finding that as people went on pilgrimage, uh, I could just see the grace, the stories that came back, which touched my heart. I thought, I'm onto something here. I'm loving this, and this is what I'm meant to do with my life. So fast forward to today, Harvest Journeys has been around for how long? What's the magnitude? What are you, where are y'all going? What, tell us about this. Yeah, sure. Um, well, we've been going for 36 years. Um, we've been running trips, World Youth Days. We just took 3,000 to Lisbon, Portugal. I was still recovering, really, yeah, from wow. the exhaustion of that. But that was, we took 800 to the Holy Land on the way to Portugal, 1,200 to Italy. Look, uh, World Youth Days and really serving the church and the bishops, you know, um, being able to uh, bring renewal to parishes around Australia mm. and, and soon to America and bring our kind of flavor of pilgrimage. Um, mm. My son works there. We've got about 15, 16 staff and... What we're about is praying and and allowing the grace uh, of serving uh, the Catholic uh, people in, in around Australia in a way that brings uh, kind of a confidence that that we're authentic, where the genuine pilgrim experience is what our slogan is. But that's because it comes from our own desire to uh, pass on. Um, our own joy, our own faith, and to allow them to, for their stories to come alive, especially as they're walking through his story in Israel, or the story of the saints, or the, the journey of Mary as we go from Fatima to Lourdes. So we just create these, these programs, these moments, where people are, are open to vulnerable, vulnerable to grace, and, um, and then what they do is they begin to share and open up on pilgrimage in a way that uh, their guards come down. And, uh, and once the guards come down, uh, there's this beautiful moment of opening up their hearts to something new and fresh and, and beginning to recognize that hope and joy and confidence can return to their faith. When I've uh, like looked into your company or tried to figure out like what makes one pilgrimage company different or more appealing to somebody, it sounds to me like you guys do a lot of work that is um, experiential, not just this is where this happened. Get back on the bus. Get back on the bus. That's true. Yeah. Well, everybody on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. You need to get the balance right on pilgrimage. It's really a matter of not just information but transformation. Mm. And, and that's actually the Beatitudes. Oh right. Yeah. yeah it's wow. Transformation <laughs> without <laughs> the information. <laughs> because Zero. There, there is there is so much noise in life, isn't there? And yeah. there's there's so much coming in, and, and even on tour, there's guides and things. So what we do is we say, let's take time out. Let's wake up early in the morning and let's go up to Mount Arbel overlooking the Sea of Galilee. We just took four hundred there with 
bishops and archbishops on the way to World Youth Day, let's wait for the breaking of dawn. Let's just allow allow the silence and the prayer, um, and people rediscover their prayer life. Mm. It's not just in the churches, but it's their one-on-one time that we fight for. In fact, I got this idea recently where we're going to start developing what we call the prayer chair. And so there's all these kind of fold-up chairs. We say, come on, pilgrims, today we're going to be sitting by the lake, and we just go and find your place and go and have your time so that all that information of learning all the, about God about the Lord becomes knowing him instead, not just knowing of him, but knowing him and giving that time for, for, for him to be with them on the pilgrimage. And once they discover that, then their prayers start to become answered through their confidence, confidence in his goodness. Hmm. So they have this, this, this kind of moments where they start sharing their stories over the dinner t- table, a glass of wine. But um, we have a, moments like the House of Grace where uh, in Haifa, there are, uh, there's uh, prisoners that have, have been released from prison and they've got no hope in their lives. And we go and visit this ministry, this beautiful man, Jerome, who speaks about how he had the heart to, to bring them in and, and teach them how to get back on their feet after. after. And it, that, that brings uh, the sense of mission into people's hearts. Bereaved parents where people have lost uh, loved ones in the war on both sides. This is in, in pre- previous to the current situation and they share how they lost their daughters, but how they learnt the only way forward was love. Mm. Uh, and they've, they, they arrive into the room and they hug each other and they share about the beauty of, and, and then you have people in the room that say, you know, I haven't, I haven't spoken to my brother for five years or my mother for eight years. If they can forgive, so can I. So those kind of encounters uh, are what people write about when they come home. And uh, it's, mm. it's just a beautiful thing to do. I've got to tell you, when I first came to America, um, the first time we had a situation where, when it came to Aussies, we had a situation where I, I brought over uh, uh, 120 pairs of flip-flops, but I was, I was saying to everyone, well, it was Australia Day, and I said, hey, everybody, we've got uh, spare thongs. To, we've got all these thongs we're hanging out. And I had no idea what I was saying and doing. Lost and, in translation. Oh, my goodness. And <laughs> English to English-ish. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> can be uh, treacherous, yeah. <laughs> I said you can wear them now if you like, but they're barefoot. But anyway, look, that was... Um, so Wait, who was sure the you audience? Your, who, was was the, who was this audience? It was the Australian Catholic... It was the American Catholic uh, preparation for World Youth Day back in 2008. Oh, wow. And I think, yeah, I have Youth to watch... Youth songs. That's right. <laughs> Flip flops, so flip flops, flip flops. Flip flops. Make sure you're barefoot when you put on your thongs. <laughs> right, yeah. Anyway, uh, that was a flip flop for me. Anyway, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a great example of where all this uh, can be kind of fun and silly. What about when you're on uh, pilgrimage or you guys are managing all these groups of where any stories you could share about something that's either I'm sure you have crazy stories about um, trying to get people out in this most recent conflict in the Middle East. That's sure ravishing and terrible, but whether it's kind of the lighthearted or the serious, I think people love to hear these stories, especially a lot of us have never been behind the scenes trying to manage, you know, even three people going on yeah. a pilgrimage, <laughs> much less thousands. 300 every month. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Do you have enough employees for that? Because like the Lord said, the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. Yeah, so right. is harvest journeys covered? <laughs> <laughs> we can always do with more. Yeah, yeah. Especially fair. in America. Yeah. <laughs> but um We've got some great stories. Um, we had uh, a friend of mine who was leading the tour. We, we had a lady who was disabled in a, in a wheelchair. And, uh, and she uh, and Paul, this leader, said to us, how am I going to look after her because we're going to be, how are we going to get out, out, of the, out of the bus and back in? And, and he was going, I said, look, Paul, I'm sorry. It, we only just found out at the last moment that she was in a wheelchair. And uh, he ended up uh, looking after her on this trip from Fatima to Lourdes and, uh, and was caring for her and lifting her in lifting her out and caring for her. and and then in Lourdes she had this moment where he he and her were sitting by uh, the grotto and he said do you want to ask God to heal you and you know from this lifelong uh, situation of paralysis and she said I, I think I have the faith and and uh, they prayed and then she began to try to get out of her wheelchair and it was all caught on film where she began to walk and got out of her wheelchair and completely became healed in Lourdes. And, and Paul, <laughs> and it was the most beautiful experience. And, you know, they, those two went home and they got married. 
What? <laughs> and I was the MC at their wedding, you know. <laughs> and it was what? one of the most beautiful moments. We had another couple that... Do you have any good stories? <laughs> <laughs> we, we had another couple that, that uh, had, had not been... Uh, they, they had were divorced and they'd gone on different pilgrimages uh, with Harvest on a, at a different time of the same year. And they were so touched that something happened as they came back. And they got remarried after mm. that pilgrimage. So, mm. wow. so, so there's this kind of uh, waking up and recognizing that with God anything is possible. Mm. And and uh, and so people regain their hope. And don't we need that? Don't we need that in this world? Yeah. And there's a sense of unity that takes place on a pilgrimage where where uh, people intermingle and start to hear their stories and. Um, there's like that dawning, just like over Lake Galilee. There's a dawning in people's hearts that just bring uh, bring a sense of anything is possible, and um, and it's just great to be a part of that. You know, there's got to be common excuses that everybody listening right now who's never been on pilgrimage or it's been a decade and they have all these whatever X, Y, and Z excuses. What do you hear the most? And what would you say to people who are, you know, coming up with their reasons that they won't go on pilgrimage? Yeah. Well, a lot of them are saying, uh, you know, I'm not ready. You know, there's that classic where I need to, uh, I'm not holy enough to go on pilgrimage or I don't want to be vulnerable to uh, what might be possible. Or my wife is the holy one and, and they get dragged along sometimes by their wife or their husband. Um, I would say um, to them that there is um, an opportunity to, to take a risk with God and to create space in your life to, for, for the unknown and to be brave and to, and to walk out in a way that uh, to go out to the unknown and, to, um, and just to be ready to listen, listen to others speak and take your time and, and, and be quiet and, and, and just allow the process of melting <laughs> uh, to come about in their hearts. And, uh, and, then, and then be open to listening to God your way, not necessarily the way others are saying it, so that they can, they can begin to touch in on, on, the, on the gentle uh, voice, the whispers of God, and especially in the places of Eucharist, because we have Eucharist every day. The Mass is a very important part. It, I think about the road to Emmaus where they were deliberating on the road, and then, and then at some point Jesus joined them on the road. And, and he began to take over, the, took over the conversation. And, um, and as, they, as they arrived, they, of course, at the breaking of bread, that, that, these, that these beautiful moments of Eucharist, whether it's on the Sea of Galilee or at the Mount of Beatitudes or at Calvary itself, there's this moment where uh, I believe so many have said, you know, did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to mm. us on the road mm -hmm. and opened up the scriptures because that's what's happening in the Holy Land. Or as we're listening to the lives of the saints and beginning to recognize that, that they speak of their poverty, they speak of their, their frailties and brokenness, which gives hope to all of us. That is the good news. And so these stories are opening up. So I guess it's uh, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's time. It's always that putting it off, though, because people all want to go. They don't want to say no, but they find excuses because it's, uh, it's an unfamiliar territory. I just say invest in a little bit of faith, be a little bit brave, and let God do the rest. Well, so with that, and you're kind of already unpacking it as you're explaining all of this, but for those who haven't maybe heard of this idea of a pilgrimage mm -hmm. versus just a tour— or just a, a vacation or travel. How how is a pilgrimage specifically different from from traveling or just uh, a vacation of some kind? Sure. Um, well, first of all, it's um, it's a it's a process where people are feeling a, a sense that um, I need to do this. They they already have a kind of an inkling that there's a calling, and they're starting to listen to that. But the process really is just. Choosing a pilgrimage, whether it's the pathways of St. Paul and going through the early churches or the Holy Land or if they have an affinity with Our Lady, you know, they choose a trip. And then, then what they do is um, really uh, it's this sense of preparing themselves and, and, uh, and having expectation that God is calling them. And as they, as they go out on this journey, they're going out with a chaplain, a priest that's a spiritual director, and he's going to be walking with them. And everything is sort of taken care of so that they don't need to worry about all the bits and pieces, the details. It's a matter of just taking away everyone's anxiety level so that they can walk into a place of peace 
they can be led and they can be guided so that they can let their guards down. And then on that pilgrimage, um, they they begin to um, they begin to open up their lives, as I said, to, with each other. And they um, we we go into places where we're able to uh, allow a, a kind of a, a moments where uh, they take time rather than rush. They take time and mm. they listen and they uh, they begin to kind of um, allow uh, the process that, that that God is with them. And uh, that journey of the spirit being with them and opening up parts of their lives that they perhaps haven't opened up before. Um, and I guess um, as they travel through on, on a journey on a bus too, they're, they're praying together. They're singing together. It's amazing how song and prayer and, and even meal and wine, it just, it just causes us to become human again and, uh, and allow, allow God to be, um, become human with them. And um, I always say that, you know, they're seeking to follow him, but he's been following them all their lives. Mm. And they come to recognize that, that beautiful fatherly um, uh, presence with them. And, uh, and then, of course, they can begin to surrender. See, they need to, we all need to come to a point of surrendering all of our prayers and recognizing that if we can just be filled first, if, if we can go on pilgrimage for ourselves first, uh, it overflows. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will then be added mm. to you as well. You know, I'm thinking about how powerful that all is and I'm imagining, you know, you've brought a whole team with you. You're here in the States for a week. You're doing a little bit of reconnaissance. Yeah. Do you imagine that part of what happens is not just kind of setting up the headquarters so that you can be more of a global enterprise, but that there could be future pilgrimages to the the, the Beatitudes tiny table? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you travel first class, of course. Of course. I mean, I can just imagine us in here, the doors open, people are like walking by, you can't talk to them, they're doing a live show right now. That's really the tiny table. Yeah, it's tinier oh, it's, than I thought. Signed by Tim Tebow. <laughs> yeah, we need three months. We got some big, big plans here. Well, speaking of big plans, we have a big plan for you to judge us here for a minute, if you will. (laughs) We've got a game called Blessed Are the Joke Makers, (laughs) for they shall inherit the points. Uh, This is going to be 37 points. Small one. Say, All right. I'm crushing it when it's small. Okay, we're going to explain to you what happens next. (laughs) So where do you get 37 from? He started with 35 and he went up by two. (laughs) I saw the number 37 (laughs) on the timer. The Holy Spirit is really the answer. <laughs> yep. So the way this works is we have two cards, a character card and a Catholic card game card. And as whatever this character is, we all have to try to answer the prompt on the Catholic card game card. So that could be a fill in the blank, a question, something. And the character cards are just kind of a generic thing, like a uh, a, a crazy clown. A or persona. A yeah. persona of some kind, not necessarily a specific. It's not going to say like as Brad Pitt or something. Right, okay. it's, it's going to be... As an American actor or something like that. So, all right. Yeah, good tweak there. People keep guessing too specific. You're doing, that's a much yeah. better intro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Try Got to it. try to paint the picture. All right. So, uh, our character that we all have to try to do. Oh, oh, real quick. And all you have to do is decide which one you enjoyed the most. Easy. Yeah. It's it's not uh, any kind of objective measure. It's just your personal <laughs> preference. So. It only uh, matters to us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jeff will try to butter you up with the fact that he brought you here. Um, he already has. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like whose line is it anyway? Yeah. The points don't matter except they do to us. Yes. <laughs> yes. We, we bicker about them. But here we go. All right. So the character card is as a broadcast news or sports anchor, there will be blank in eternity. Right, mate, in eternity, there's going to be lots of amazing times at the beach. In fact, bring your runners and bring your brolly and keep those shark biscuits away from me. We are going to be enjoying the beach. Do I comment? Do I comment now? Oh no! Wait, wait till we all. You can, but you're not voting right now because you got to see how bad they are. I'm just putting it out there, Paul. No, I love it. Shark biscuit. Great. Yeah, that's right. In in uh, in heaven, there will be lots of fo- footy. There will be all kinds of footy, mostly Aussie rules. And uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be fantastic. It'll be uh, heaps of fun, going off like a frog in a sock. And uh, and uh, and uh, oh, and running up the field is uh, is uh, the Rock Chop Jayhawks. I, I don't know. That's not <laughs> that's not that's not one of their teams. But you got it. Um, 
But yeah, so tune in tonight at nine. <laughs> Good evening, San Diego. <laughs> That's right. We've got Philip Ryle here, uh, all the way from Down Under. I don't know where that is. But I know that in eternity, there will definitely be scotch. Lots of scotch. <laughs> I love scotch. My dog Baxter, of course. <laughs> and pleated pants. I'm Ron Burgundy. For anybody listening, <laughs> that's lips or lips. Nick's Nick's lips quiver right before he goes into full character. <laughs> it's it's amazing. A, it's a transformation moment. Yeah, it's not information. It's we, transformation. Yeah, we all kind of yeah, went on a we pilgrimage go. with Nick there. Yeah. <laughs> Spiritual. Well. I mean, I don't know what to say, but you have to judge have us. Have you ever had a, an episode where there were no winners? <laughs> wow. wow. I mean, you can yeah, just geez. withhold points. That is an option. I suppose that is. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, That's... look, I'm sorry, guys. Um, was that meant to be an Aussie accent? Uh, it sounded... Mine was not. His so... sounded, sounded no. cockney. His, his no. was, yeah, his was like a... I always bleed into, like, British cockney. This got everywhere. Yeah. His uh, was not. Yeah. I just wanted to sh- say shark bait, which means kids on the beach, <laughs> according to my Australian dictionary. <laughs> look, I thought you were brilliant. Don't I you. thought you tried to copy the brilliance, but you did pretty well. <laughs> Thank you. But the fact that they were both so bad and you didn't try and copy the brilliance for that. You, mm. wow. You got it. I give my points to this man. <laughs> Let's go. <Yeah>! Oh. <laughs> the fake out there. I feel like he just took us on a pilgrimage then. <laughs> right. To the dumpster. Woo! That's <laughs> the dumpster of our performance. Smallest points ever. Uh, <laughs> Quivering lips, Nick Besner, <laughs> with his amazing pullout win there. We'll see you tomorrow. San- <laughs> you stay classy, San Diego. <laughs> hey, you owe me. <laughs> Feel the thrill for being our celebrity guest judge. You get a pair of socks from SockReligious.com. Wow. These are super religious. You're getting the Swiss Guard. Whoa, nice. So nice. So and cool. since you have such a quiet personality, we thought we'd give you a loud pair of socks that you can sport on pilgrimage. <laughs> And um, this is a little bit of cultural exchange from a country I don't even live in. So, anyways, uh, that's it for us for a second. We'll be right back to the break on Beatitudes. The team at Aquinas Wealth Advisors believes that good values and good returns are not mutually exclusive. Using a tech-smart and morally sound approach, they provide investment alternatives that align with Catholic teachings without sacrificing returns. These days... Faith-driven investors are finding it hard to know where their money is going. They have no visibility into what their dollars are supporting, but there's a better way. Thanks to the Faith and Finance Score from Aquinas Wealth Advisors, you can look into your current holdings to see what you're supporting and make a switch to an advisor that aligns with your values and gives power to your voice. Check out AquinasWealth.com today. Hi, it's Paul Kolker from the Beatitudes here, and I just wanted to share with you guys that I also, outside of the show, perform improv comedy on a regular basis with a group called Divine Comedy. So what we do is we come up with everything on the spot, so whether you're looking for faith-filled, fun, family-friendly comedy for your youth night, or whether you're looking for clean comedy for your corporate event, Divine Comedy can perform for your group and even get you in on the action. So if you'd like to hire us to come out and perform for your next event, check out DivineComedyImprov.com. Divine Comedy, an inferno of fun. Welcome back, everybody. We are here with our second Australian in the first two seasons. That's pretty wild. (laughs) But only one per season. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's all the rules. That's all we can handle. (laughs) These are the rules. We didn't make them up. We just followed them strictly. Correct. Uh, Philip Ryle, how are you, my friend? I'm very well. Wonderful. Um, (laughs) I loved some of those stories you had in the first segment there, especially mentioning how people's guards can come down as they're experiencing something. We'd love to know more. I'm, I'm assuming you were on most, if not all, of the first pilgrim pilgrimages yeah. of your company yeah. have you experienced this sort of guard coming down what has that transformation like been in your life in your journey well yes so look it uh for me it was started when i was a young man philip means lover of horses and uh and so uh i went i went on a uh, i had an experience at a horse riding camp where 
they, they spoke to me about love uh, pouring into my heart that I just need to ask Jesus. So I had that encounter. Uh, I knew what it was like to be in love at the age of 13. And, uh, and so my story, my story of encounter caused me to then say, I, I want to go on a pilgrimage where uh, my own experience is that um, my, I will sort of come to a place of contemplation, a place where I sort of lose my words. I'm a wordy person normally. And so to come to that place where I can actually be quiet and begin to just allow that uh, transformation to take place is really beautiful. Um, I think it's what I experience in watching pilgrims come alive. Um, I think that's, for me, the, when I was touching the rock of Calvary, for example, and I knelt and I, and I touched the rock and just really understanding that this is the place where, where Jesus uh, died. And there's that moment uh, where you're just kneeling, bowing before the crucifix and, uh, and just thanking God. I think what it does is it brings up this gratitude in your heart. And I think this is what happens on pilgrims, that with pilgrimages they, they just find a gratitude in their heart where they just become uh, thankful for everything in their lives. And so they turn from looking at what they don't have to, to what they do have mm. and then asking God to multiply that. Look, I love the Sea of Galilee. I love uh, being on the Sea of Galilee. They stop the engines on the boat and there's this quiet moments where you can just hear the water lapping on the sides mm. and you're saying Jesus walked on this water and he and he calmed the storm and and people just have these moments there we walked the Jesus trail we we found a place between the the valley of the doves in Israel where there's this uh, journey this old shepherd's trail between Capernaum and Nazareth and which Jesus frequented and we mm. worked out a way to get through the creeks by giving pilgrims these socks that go up to their knees they tie up and so they still wear their shoes, but they can actually walk on water through through the little tributaries <laughs> and creeks, and and experience the very place where Jesus walked on the way down to Magdala, mm. and so moments like that for me, discovering and the, discovering them, and then saying, I need to bring this back. I need to create uh, experiences that others will experience the feeling that I have, that I know will touch their lives forever, and so. Uh, for me, it, it, it's a it's a place where I just am awestruck, and uh, and and I love to share everything I discover in my heart. I love to share with the the pilgrims, uh, so that they can actually um, come back and and begin to share their stories and open up. Yeah. Hey Phil, I got to tell you something. You just brought back a cool memory. My first trip to the Holy Land, I was definitely one of those people who said, "I'm going, but I'm not holy enough." But let's go. And there was things I just didn't even know. Yeah. And uh, we get to Calvary, and our, my group was ten people from the U.S just from all over, and there was only three of us, four of us from Texas. And I was climbing up those stairs to get up to the top where you can go to the rock in Calvary, thinking I was like the first one in my group. I thought I was going to be pretty alone because there wasn't many tourists yeah. in 2006. Mm. I get up there, and some other group is up there, and as soon as I step foot on there, they start singing, Were You There When They Crucified My mm, Lord? Yes. Real soft mm. and just beautiful, and I could barely walk to the rock because I was crying so much. My knees were shaking, mm. and you talked about music as being this place where we we're able to let go and we're able to let God in. Yeah. And I thought, this mm. is going to be awesome. This is going to be important. I can't even describe that what I experienced was far beyond awesome or important. It's not a describable moment no. because it wasn't like I was experiencing it in my, I'll write a journal about this later moment. You know, it was something else. Yeah, so, that's right. mm. man, you're nailing us with that one. Yeah. Um, listen, we can't take a pilgrimage today to Australia, but can you bring a little bit of Australia in here to the tiny table. What, what's that, mate? Oh, <laughs> yeah. No. Well, one thing I will say is we do want to bring Australians, Americans, and Kiwis together. What and, are Kiwis? I, I, Kiwis are New Zealanders. New Zealanders. I thought yeah. you all hated each other. Yeah, well, we love each other when it comes to the Christian world. Oh, we okay. try. We try anyway. <laughs> that cool. helps. Yeah. Yes, Brothers. me too. <laughs> That's uh, St. Brother. Paul said there are now no longer Australians or Kiwis, <laughs> male or female. Yeah, it's it's in there. If he had known of Australia. Oh, oh, yes. oh, you know what? You might be able oh. to put, tilt these back like yeah. this. We can try wow. to do something we didn't think about. Is we it? didn't see that, that hat no, because boy. it was hidden down under. Oh, That's <laughs> <laughs> this was given to me by an Aboriginal elder. They've just put a cross in the center of Australia. I bet it's you know what? You can ditch the headset. It's, the I? mic still works. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, we can yeah. still hear you. And you hear you. They just <laughs> heal you. <laughs> they just <laughs> heal you. <laughs> I can't talk good. No, we, can't. Can't. <laughs> we just built a 20-meter cross in the center of Australia. 
and, uh, and the indigenous people who had been evangelized to our Lord there. And, uh, and the Aboriginal elder gave me this. We're trying to bring pilgrims to the mm. centre of Australia, which is a wonderful thing because uh, the indigenous people of our land is the great wound within Australia. And so if yeah. we can reconcile and bring churches together under the cross, um, and, uh, and the elders are saying, we just want to be one and we want to be a part of being one in Australia. Mm. Um, the great wound, as the great wound is, is healed and we're reconciled and we begin to love on each other, and, and begin to uh, heal from that, uh, I believe a great grace will come upon Australia. So this hat means a lot to me from this elder who, who gave me this hat. But I have a gift for you guys that I brought. Now, a Kubra. What? Uh, these are Kubra hats. So this I, is our reverse no Simpsons way. before our TBD, by the way. <laughs> We're getting a reverse. Now, reverse. these are the very best hats Wala. you're going to ever have. What? No way. And you are get you to kidding choose. me? Come of course, on. I have to take them back after. No, I don't. Know <laughs> oh, my God. I'll lick it. Okay. You should have Which seen that want? going through you customs. Want <laughs> you want the, oh, it matches your jacket. I guess Go it does. It. Yeah, now Doesn't you got the, you guys have got the same problem here now, trying to put the uh, the hats on. I'm, oh, ditch, I'm ditching the headset. That's perfect. What? What? Come on. Wow. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. Whoa, <laughs> that does look I'll good. I'll play the juice harp. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I thought, you know, what I thought I'd do. So it means that a kubra means headgear in Aboriginal. And so I just thought it'd be now that you got the hat on, you guys need to, <laughs> you guys need to tell, you need oh. to speak Aussie here. Oh, let's and go. And I'm gonna let you know how you go. <coughs> it's like a script. Oh it's wait, it, it even says three. Do we go in order? <coughs> oh wait, what's my, gonna happen? What uh, is this? This is a new deodorant called Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, guys, if I can spray oh. a bit of Australia. That's the smell of an Australian uh, Australian whoa. armpit. That is right. awesome. smells just like the junior That's high not locker a smell. room. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, mm. blokes, now, hey, bloke. this is how you talk Australian. When you go in the country, they talk like this, and they say the skeeters got me last night. You may, say, what's the skeeters? That's the mosquitoes. Yeah. All right. And uh, I need you guys to kind of see, see if you can emulate my Australian accent. The skeeters got me in the, the whop whop. <laughs> no, you stick to the oh, script, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to say it in Aussie. I'm going to tell you how you went. Does and he go first? Is he, I I've got a number three. one. Is that me? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah you, okay. you go number one. Uh, good day, mate. How you going? Cheers. <laughs> no worries. Oh, <laughs> not not good at all. That, <laughs> woof, woof. That it's, <laughs> woof. It, it should be, good day, mate. How you going? Cheers. Gone. No worries. No how you worries. How you going? How you going? Cheers. Cheers. It means, hello, my friend. How are you feeling today? You have nothing to worry about. <laughs> Okay, I thought that was funny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. She'll be right, Carver. You're a fair dinkum good bloke, eh? You betcha. <laughs> Ooh, you sound like a B grade actor. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> sad for me because I'm trying to be a real actor. <laughs> it, 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 it actually means everything's going to be okay, my fellow dude. You're, you're an authentic, nice guy that I would place my bet on. Cool. Just thought I'd share that too. Well, okay. Yeah. And then what about uh, you, Jeff? First of all, I'm not going to talk about meters with you because I don't know what a meter is. But here we go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, mm -mm. You put your jaw down like that? Yeah. You just put yeah. it down? Okay. It's got to. Don't come the raw bra. <laughs> don't come the raw bra with me, you bludger. Oh, <laughs> bludger? <laughs> you sound like you're from Manchester. It says, don't come the raw prawn with me, you bludger. That's how it is, which means do not attempt to deceive me with your insincerity, you lazy waste of time. Do uh, not attempt to s <laughs> deceive me with your insincerity, you lazy waste of time. No, <laughs> oh, dear. So uh, if I ever get invited back on this show, this will not be included anymore. Amazing. Now We're going to have to get new headsets so we can wear these on every <laughs> episode. <laughs> yeah, oh, good. Well, uh, you guys have the Texan hats. I thought I'd introduce you to the Akubra I hat. Love it. I love it. Akubra. Akubra. We don't Akubra. roll our R's in Australia. <laughs> Akubra. A Australia. A-K-U-B-R-A. A-K-U-B-R-A. One of you's got the higher quality one. I'm not sure who has that. Uh, it's probably going to be Jeff. I didn't do it on purpose, guys. <laughs> no, you've got it there. Oh. oh. Hey. I didn't even, I didn't even mean Perfect. to. You're about to be A-list. <laughs> hey. Moving my way oh, up. This is why we needed to measure our heads the other day. <laughs> you, what, what you needed was more of this. You might, Wait, you might what need the smaller what, one. Yeah, yeah, what number were I'm, we? I'm a 59. Yeah, this is a 59. And we 59. measured our heads. Yeah. yeah. Were you all 59? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh. 
Then okay. I guess we're all, all the same. We're good. Cool. <laughs> I was hoping I could. It was all like within a, like a quarter inch. A little hat exchange there. But this one's the real deal. But. That's pretty close. Do you know the way that this fits? Like it's it's not too tight, I like but it's it. tight enough that if I was on a kangaroo, it would stay on. <laughs> you know you don't ride kangaroos. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, feel like that you don't understand my love language. No. It's challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't tell Jeff what he can't do. <laughs> I'll be spraying everybody in town with Australia <laughs> deodorant. What accent was that? <laughs> oh gosh. All right, on to the. Next segment, please. <laughs> yeah. So that was our reverse Simpsons. <laughs> so we will finish the show differently by doing our TBD question of the day. Hey, yeah. How about it? Weird, right? Hey. Totally mixing it up. <laughs> mixing it up. All right. Every one of us gets to participate uh, in this uh, question, Phil. And uh, I'm shooting from the hip here. The question is really, talk to us about the quality and the experience of your dreams. So hmm. are you somebody who gets good sleep? And from a dream standpoint, are you just, yeah. wh- how do you kind of react to that? Do you like to share your dreams? Do you not know your dreams? Anybody feeling like they can go first? We're going to let you go last on this one, Phil. Okay. I'm happy to jump in. Yep. I feel like I haven't really – I don't have any recurring dreams, mm-hmm. and I don't dream often. If I do, it's usually on a night when I don't get that good of sleep. Yep. Right? Yep. You, or at least you can remember them in those instances, I think, a little bit better. But, yeah, there's nothing really that – literally like I think I sleep heavy and hard, and so I don't – have a lot of like dreams that are coming on a regular basis i guess whether they're the same dream or not i just don't i wouldn't say like oh i probably have a dream a month that i remember no it's Mm -hmm. less than that nick and i have room dogged it on several business trips before and i can tell you he does sleep hard because i get foot cramps they're the kind where you fall out of bed (laughs) in writhing pain and i'm like sorry about last night and he's like what happened (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's real nice for my wife when she's like do you not hear the babies crying like, no, no I don't the answer is no I can verify you must that. punch me <laughs> Riley he also doesn't hear Jeff crying so <laughs> which is a regular occurrence <laughs> on business trips <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about it oh okay I'm ah, sorry yes yeah. um, alright yeah so my experience is kind of interesting um if I take some sort of sleep supplement, usually like GABA or something along those lines, I tend to just conk out, but then I have a really hard time waking up. Mm. But if I do that, then I do tend to have more vivid dreams, which is interesting. And they're usually some twists. Sometimes they're more like nightmares, and sometimes they're more, you know, whatever, uh, peaceful, you know, enjoyable. But um, the ones I tend to remember are the ones that are more nightmarish, but like, about a realistic mm, thing, mm. which is a weird thing to wake up with, and you're like, "Did that happen? Is that real?" Um, I you mean, you almost know it because you're taking the GABA. Yes, I like I know what I'm in for, but sometimes that helps me you actually yeah. sleep, yeah. like yeah. Uh, oh. because I've been having Wolf. off and on for like the last year or so, and and weirdly, I've been hearing this from other people too. So I don't know if there's like not to, I mean. I don't know if there's some sort of um, greater sort of attack that uh, we as a country sure. are under or just the world, right. the environment that we're in these days. But um, I've been waking up pretty consistently at like three something in the morning. Mm. And I've heard that from a lot of other Catholics, uh, either online or in person, like mm. people sharing these kinds of stories. And, and you know, I've been told through spiritual direction, just, OK, say some prayers. Right. And then. um basically invite our lady to wrap you in her mantle and mm. and then go back to sleep that way and I'll sometimes distract myself with like headphones and a YouTube video that's innocuous you know sure. something just to what it, take my mind off of it um but yeah something about that that time period so I don't know it's not just me either that I have I have found this out so but that's part of why I've been taking the sleep supplement you could lead the renewal of doing the second divine mercy at three in the morning you know, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, because, I mean, I Bunch could. Bunch of people are up. Let's yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's go for it. I mean, and it, it only takes, what, like 10 minutes yeah. to get through it, mm-hmm. and so um, that's about the amount of time I need if you, anyway. If you fell asleep doing it, that's a grace, too. There you go. Man, I feel like this is a cool question. I would have never thought this question yeah. I would be learning stuff. Um, I used to be a, a somebody who remembered their dreams, who I felt like I was talked to in my dreams, um, became very clear to things mm-hmm. I needed to figure out or whatever. Uh, since baby number three came, which... I think he's six years old. Um, I sleep in a state of heightened awareness as if I'm in a war zone. Mm. And so <laughs> deep sleep, I can sleep instantly, which I think is kind of like a war thing. Like you yeah. lay down, sleep real quick. Yeah. And boy, I wake up a lot. 
It's like no. I'm ready for whatever kid is screaming, throwing <laughs> up, running down the hall, waking That's up the a baby. Blessing. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I think he thinks Nick's is a Can blessing. Can we do that thing where we drink each other's Topo Chico and switch places on this for a minute? You'll miss it one day. <laughs> no, no, it is a blessing, but um, to the point where it scares everybody in my family because I wake up swinging. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I've had to train myself to keep the arms down. Might not be a burglar if they're only three feet high. <laughs> <laughs> and saying, Daddy, I want some milk. <laughs> You can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> if you saw that on the video version of the podcast, Jeff just struck the air version of I a small nearly, child. <laughs> and I nearly broke it. That's how hard that swing was. You wow. know, my kids used to come down early in the morning and, and they go, I can't sleep. I'd say, go back to bed. And Jenny would say, oh, no, come in, come in. <laughs> and, and, and then the next one would come and it would be like a production line. The second one going, I had a nightmare. I said, and I'd be screaming at them, and I'm such a kind person outside of my sleep. And yeah. I'm, I'm brutal in the middle of the night, but Jenny was invite them into the bed, and it, they're good memories. But for me, you know, do you ever get ideas um, in the middle of the night, and it's like, it's brilliant. No one's ever thought of that, and you wake up, you turn the light on, and you write it down, and you just get, go to bed thinking, I'm going to be famous from that <laughs> you, The next morning, you, you look at it, you go, that's not good. <laughs> In the night, it's just the most brilliant thing ever. But for me, I, I think with dreams, um, I'm learning to ask, ask God before I go to sleep that, uh, you know, you take over now. Mm-hmm. This, is my, this is my downtime. You know, get me while my guard's down. And... Um, and uh, and just kind of almost expect that he wants to he wants to place things in our hearts, and I even think that the dreams we have we can say the ones I don't remember, the message or what you're trying to say to me, let it bless my heart anyway, and let my heart take it in so that it ends up becoming a blessing which I don't necessarily have to understand. I had a dream the other night just quickly where uh, where, where I just had it was so vivid it was uh, I got I, I I woke up and told Jenny but. There was this old man with a beard running up the this, the top of a train, like like in a in a in a Mission Impossible movie, and he's running towards me. And he he's looking at me, and he's and and I'm like this helicopter view looking down on this train, and he's looking at me saying, "You are David, you are David, you are David," and he's trying to convince me that I'm that I'm David, and 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 it caused me to begin to read all about David and his mm. courage, and and I needed to hear that. In in I realized mm. as I began to open up scripture and recognize he was speaking right to my heart. It was just so clearly that he was looking into my eyes. I guess I'll take that as Jesus himself sc- screaming at me to convince me to take courage for something I'm going through in this season. And um, I started to listen to harp music, David harp music in my prayer times, just to to, to allow mm-hmm. allow the soothing of, of and to, to kind of embrace the that that was a dream from God rather than just say, oh, that was interesting. But mm. to take it seriously to, and to allow it to be planted in my heart and allow whatever the message is to start to change me. And it's really had a beautiful effect. So I'm looking forward to and having expectation on dreams becoming more and more a part of my journey, especially as I, as I lay my head down to sleep that I give over my heart and say, you take over. Was the train in that dream stopping at the stations of the cross? <laughs> Well, no, it was actually, uh, is that a joke? Yeah. <laughs> kind of. wow. I got it, I got it. I'm a bit slow, yes. Actually, you want to hear something true, Phil? You told me part of that story in the lobby. We were kind of waiting before the show. Yeah. But I couldn't understand. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I couldn't understand your accent. I thought you were telling me the guy was yelling, you are dated. You are dated <laughs> as if you were old. And I was like, what does this have to do with courage? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> So we can't understand each other, can we? <laughs> We're doing all right. Now that we put on the hats, I, I could understand you... you as soon as I put on my didgeridoo. <laughs> no, it's the deodorant that I was spraying. That was, well, that listen, was, that made the difference. Yes. if you are not Catholic and you're watching this show and you think that we're a church full of smells and bells, you should be in the studio right now because... That smell lingers yeah. from the uh, yeah. Australia Strong. deodorante. Um, <laughs> it may never go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Tim Tebow's going to have to deal with that too. All right, well, listen, coming back for the bonus episode, we do Friday bonus episodes. We're going to be back with Phil Ryle in the bonus episode. In the meantime, we're going to see you in your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> and for the rest of you, we will see you in the Eucharist. God bless you, mate. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to join us at our undersized table, subscribe to the video version of the show on YouTube by typing at, that's the symbol at, so shift and two on your keyboard, at 
the underscore Beatitudes on YouTube. We'll see you there. This podcast is part of the Spoke Street Network. For more great podcasts, visit Spokestreet.com.